I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Brigadier General Jeffrey Weiss, an active duty Air Force officer serving on the Joint Staff in the Operations Directorate. Brigadier General Weiss has civilian experience as a systems engineer, and his military experience includes wartime operational, USAF, and Joint Headquarters staff and command leadership positions in Homeland Air Defense, Air and Missile Defense, Theater Air Battle Management, Command and Control, Nuclear Deterrence, and Information Influence Operations. He's commanded at the wing, group, and squadron levels and holds four master's degrees in military and aeronautical study areas, including an MS in National Security Strategy from the National War College. His articles have appeared in the Air and Space Power Journal and Joint Force Quarterly, and his book, The New Art of War, Origins, Theory, and Future of Conflict, is what we'll be discussing today. So, Jeffrey, welcome, sir. Let me start by thanking you so much for your career of service. And I, I want to start out also by asking what inspired you to write The New Art of War, and what kind of response have you had so far since publication for this book? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Tim. It's an honor to be uh, here. I'm excited to have the opportunity to be here with you uh, and, and with your audience um, to discuss my book, The New Art of War, uh, just published last year uh, by Cambridge University about a year ago. Um, before we begin, I am required to offer the disclaimer that I am participating uh, in strictly an unofficial capacity. Uh, as such, my comments are my own and not the official position of any government uh, agency or department. So I just have to get that, I have to get that out of the way. Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, but, but again, it's a real honor to be here. So uh, the question, uh, the inspiration for the book, uh, you, know, you, know, you mentioned that, that my background includes engineering. Engineers are pretty much problem solvers. And that's kind of how I am by nature, a lot of us are. Um, and, uh, and so the inspiration came uh, in 2008 after a couple of years of intensive study uh, on war, uh, I was I was with the Marines at the, at Quantico at the, uh, at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College, and then I followed on to the School of Advanced Warfighting, uh, which has a great uh, travel program. By the way, uh, I got to travel throughout Europe, uh, in Asia, Vietnam, uh, a lot of places, and actually walk the ground uh, that, that a lot of uh, history is written on. Um, so, in this class, I was tasked to write a, a paper on future war. And, uh, and I thought to myself, and after, again, this was sort of the capstone, I thought to myself, well, how do we know anything about future war? I, you know, at the time, uh, I mean, I think a lot of us can agree that, that many warriors, uh, strategists, and policymakers have, have thought about war uh, throughout the ages, and frequently they get it wrong. Um, and so the question in my mind was why? You know, how could I be different and, and get things more right? Um, and in my book, is, uh, chapter five is dedicated to the future of war and future war. Uh, and and I, as I highlight, it's really hard to know anything about the future anyways, right? I mean, if we could do that, we wouldn't have to have jobs, right? We could just bet on things. Um, but in any case, I, I began to realize that um, the problem lies with our, uh, you know, a failure to understand war in all of its entirety, Um and after some more re research, I found that a great deal of our ignorance uh, about war stems from deficiencies uh, in our understanding of war's nature. Uh, and a lot of this comes be because of the fact that we get our, our war theory. That's where we get a lot of our, our understanding of war's nature. We can look out the window and see what war looks like at this moment. But if we want to know about wars, what wars really like, you know, from Thucydides time 2,500 years ago till today, what are those constants, we go to war theory, and you look at people like Sun Tzu and Thucydides and Clausewitz, um, and the problem is that, that these theorists are very frequently misunderstood. They wrote a long time ago. They're subject to translation. Um, so, you know, as a result, um, they can appear to contradict each other, and, and many of the, of the uh, individuals that think about war, again, I kind of put these in three categories. You have warriors or practitioners. You have strategists who are trying to decide what it is the warriors need to do. And you have policymakers acting at the political level who are deciding whether to use war or not uh, as a tool of, of, poli of, of political action. And all these individuals contemplate it uh, and, they, and they form into different camps. And as such, um, none of the theorists really have authority to inform our thinking. And so without authoritative theory, 
uh, to guide our thinking re regarding war's timeless truths, we're left with what are we left with? We're left with personal experience. You know, I saw this, I read that, uh, historical case studies. You know, my favorite is the Peloponnesian War, my favorite is the Vietnam War, my favorite is World War II, and everything we need to know is in that war. And Clausewitz is one of the individuals that actually warned us against doing that sort of thing, but we almost can't help ourselves. And so, um, you know, prior prior to, you know, one of the main things I found was that we always get wrong is is whether or not a war is going to require us to fight kind of in a regular manner or an irregular manner. And uh, because a lot of the theory, none of the theory really reconciles those two sides. So it's like, well, this is this says this and that says that. And and I disagree with you. And I think Clausewitz is the best. No sun suits for kindergartners. You know, so this debate just makes it. As a result, as a warrior or a strategist, I just like, all right, I'm going to throw this in the garbage can and I'm just going to come up with something, you know, to meet a timeline. And that's really not, I mean, imagine, for example, if doctors and engineers lacked authoritative texts on, say, anatomy and physiology or biology or physics. I mean, these are the underlying science that inform these, these professions. But as war fighters, what's our underlying science? What, what tells us the fundamental nature? There's all these things all over the place. And so that's really when I said what we need is is someone needs to take a look at all this stuff and, and synthesize it uh, into into something into something that's unified, that's comprehensive, that's authoritative, that includes all of war's forms and domains, doesn't leave cyberspace out, doesn't leave the Navy out, doesn't only apply in 2022 or doesn't only apply in you know, 1889. Uh, and obviously that's a hard thing to do, but that's really what we need if we're going to avoid the strategic pitfalls. So um, that's kind of the motivation for it. And all this, because again, I was trying to solve the problem of future war and I didn't feel like I had the coherent theory. Um, and so I was just left, you know, without, without a real sense, I'm just picking at things that are happening right now. And it's not really authoritative and it'll probably be wrong in, in 10 years. And, and as an example, when I was doing this, Everything that it was talked about was small wars or unconventional war. We were in uh, Afghanistan, the United States, and and uh, we were fighting against insurgents and and suicide bombers and things like that. And 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 it was told to us at that time, which is not that long ago, less than 20 years ago, that that's what the future of war is going to be. And now where are we? We're being told it's great power competition, you know. So so what is it? You know, how, why are we uh, bouncing back and forth? on these sorts of things. So I think oh, that's absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, again, this this was a tremendous undertaking. And I, I just finished reading this yesterday. And, you know, I, the, I guess I would describe this as brilliant. And one of the things that I saw was it it strikes me as a modern approach to a classical treatise, right? And, and you know, I guess that makes sense because so many of the influences there are historical in nature, right? And you mentioned several of those, Sun Tzu and Clausewitz and, um, you know, Thucydides. So it, it seemed like you, you definitely very strong focus on theory, but there are also philosophical underpinnings on the origin and nature of conflict. And again, I, I see a copy of it on the bookshelf behind you, a brilliant work. I would strongly recommend people read this and I'll, I'll put links in the interview as well down at the bottom so that people can click on it. In terms of writing it, which historical texts would you say most influenced your style? Well, I, you know, it's hard to say, you know, in the book, I actually, you'll recall, I have a, a chart that actually shows the influences of various uh, theorists. And most of that is restricted to war theorists throughout the whole book. There's Aristotle, there's Plato, there's Rousseau, there's Einstein, there's Freud, because war is so wrapped up in so many different uh, disciplines, and I'm leaving out archaeologists, things like that. So I just say, uh, you know, I definitely take an Aristotelian approach, which is to say, I wanted to lay out the whole thing. Uh, you know, from beginning to end, from initial premises, uh, here's what other very substantial people have said from a variety of different uh, approaches. Uh, here's, uh, you know, here's here's what I believe that you as a warrior, as a as a strategist or as a policymaker need to pull out of it. These are the most important things. You, I've done all the reading for you. Uh, here's what I think is important. I encourage people to read the original text, but uh, what I wanted to do is put it all on a table so it doesn't look like I'm just parachuting in with a bunch of ideas and like, where did all this come from? Uh, I wanted people to say, okay, he's very systematically working his way through it. So it's very Aristotelian. 
uh, lay it all out. Here's what people uh, have said before, and then here are what the conclusions we can draw from the premises using logic, using uh, other things like that, and then and then moving forward. And certainly, um, if you in chapter two, uh, I, ha I lay out um, the, uh, the what I call the magnificent seven plus uh, some uh, theorists from other other different areas like small war theorists and, and domain like air power theorists, maritime theorists, and so forth. So really, they're all they've all been influential to the ideas, but the overall construct has been Aristotelian in the sense that uh, you know I wanted to be comprehensive about it. Uh, and then I also used an Aristotelian methodology, which is the four causes model, which is to say that war can be like any other phenomenon can be uh, thought of in terms of four causes, uh, material, formal, efficient, final, which just roughly is materials, the stuff, formal yeah. is what it looks like, efficient is what causes it, in other words, humanity, war, for example, and then the final cause being what is its object, you know, a political object. And, if, and throughout, the, throughout the book, I wanted to keep all that intertwined so that um, so that I'm not leaving anything out. So people can't say, well, he's totally not, you know, considered this, this part of war. And that led to a definition. It led to a true trinity of humanity uh, with politics as a human activity uh, that may or may not include war. And then combat specifically being that thing that, that designates political competition from nonviolent political competition from violent political competition. So, so I would definitely say all these things kind of, you know, came together uh, overall, percolated in my mind over 13 years and, and resulted in, in the book that you see now. Oh, absolutely. It, you know, and so it, the synthesis, I, I think that's one of the things that strikes me. And definitely that's one of the most contemporary aspects of it. Right. And so for people who are familiar with Sun Tzu, to me, that's always read almost like a, a, a instructions in a chess manual. You know, it's, uh, you know, this group does this and that group does that. And remember to do this, you know, now in contrast to that, you have really reformulated and explained the axioms of warfare with the benefit of new learning. I mean, there's there's psychology, sociology, biology and archaeology in there. Um, it definitely seemed and I'll, I'll ask this in a moment. It seemed like you had one foot in in diplomacy, you know, and then, you know, and another foot in strategy. Right. And so. Um, I, it was this convergence of many different things, as well as a modernization. And that that was one of the parts where, again, I looked at that and I said, this must have been such a challenge to write, you know, to be able to marry Clausewitz, who was writing you know, hundreds of years ago with Sun Tzu, who was writing thousands of years ago, and then be able to discuss cyber warfare. I mean, that that is no easy task. Um well, so if it's okay, I, I do want to ask about diplomacy. John Dingle sure. said that war is a failure of diplomacy. And actually, I believe Tony Benn said something similar. So I, I don't get nailed in the comments for it. But while these, these two things, war and diplomacy, are antagonistic to each other, they're also related, especially in areas like strategic signaling. Um, how do you view the interplay of these two very different approaches to resolving differences between nations? Well, that's a great question, and uh, and you know I, I don't know that I could do it do it by myself, which is which is why I did the uh, the synthesis of so many different viewpoints on a lot of these things. One one of one of the concepts that's talked about in the book, and this is common, most people are, are familiar with instruments of power, uh, diplomacy. Uh, so a lot of times they're they're summarized as dime, you know, diplomacy, information, military, economics. Uh, one of the things I think people need to realize is that these things are all interrelated. Uh, yeah. It's not. I mean, you can't have economics without information. You can't have uh, diplomacy without military. I mean, you can, but I mean, they're abstractions. Uh, realistically, uh, you have to have those things. So I think there is an interplay um, between these. In particular, a lot of times we think so we're thinking grand strategy. One of the things I really strive for in my book is to be abstract and to be multi-level. So to say, for example, one of the things I say, these instruments of power work at any any level. Like, I, you know, we're using an instrument of power right now to influence an audience about uh, this topic in this book, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, governments use uh, multimedia and, as you said, you know, strategic uh, messaging uh, and, and they move, you know, chess pieces around the global board. And all of that, um, the mil what people need to understand is the military part is is part of that. Um, and military is not necessarily when we talk about grand strategy, which is, you know, how my country, you know, is going to be successful in a, in a world of multiple countries, all with different capabilities and characteristics. How do I use all the instruments of power at my 
disposal to advance my interest and protect my my people and my country. That's where grand strategy comes in. And and diplomacy is part of that. And the military is part of that when it's not war. So um, so I think that uh, we have to think about all these things, but we but we have to really understand war, how it starts, uh, why it starts, how it progresses, what decisions are made in it, how it ends. And this is a very difficult thing I talk about in chapter one, as you'll probably recall. This is something we get wrong so frequently. Um, but we need to understand that. And that's if we do, then we understand then we can make diplomacy be more effective and diplomacy being, you know, the nonviolent ways that I communicate with other countries, uh, you know, to defuse tensions or to get my interests done. A lot of times it's just positive. In some cases it can, you know, with foes, it can be negative. But that signaling is very important and military is part of that. And if we understand, again, how these transitions happen and what, you know, what peace is, what competition is. I define this in the book, you know, there's four zones what we call like true peace, um, you know, competition, conflict and war, where conflict would be like, you know, violence that's not to the level of war, which I would say is political violence to advance the objectives. Again, we could go on a lot. And I know in the interest of time, but I would just say uh, it's very important that we understand war. It's very important that we understand, you know, what that line is between moving into it. And then we, and as Sun Tzu said, we must understand ourselves, our objectives. Our potential adversaries, their objectives, have all that on the table. Be honest about it. And an example is the Cuban Missile, missile Crisis, for example, where Kennedy uh, used the military very effectively uh, to deter um, the Soviet Union from, from placing missiles on Cuba. Uh, and so that's an example where the military was used to actually prevent a war, if you will, and, uh, and it worked. Uh, but you can't necessarily say it would work in every case. And again, that's the other point I would just like to foot stomp is that uh, historical case studies are great, but theory helps us pull out the things that are timeless from those case yeah. studies. And that's where we have to be careful. And that's where theory can inform us and help diplomacy be more successful. Well, it, you know, it, one of the quotes that you cited, actually, and this one struck me, that was why I put it in the questions, but you, you, you cited Trotsky, who said, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. and you know, I, I, when I read that, I was just thinking, you know, it, it, I guess it may not, it, 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 I, none of us like to admit that aggression is part of human nature, right? But if we all share the same planet, if it's in anyone's nature, then shouldn't we all be prepared for it? I mean, I could go on and on with quotes, uh, you know, the, and, the, and a lot of them are in the book. I tried to pull out a lot of quotes and, uh, you know, George Washington uh, said, you know, the best way, way to you know, prevent war, to be prepared for it. Uh, there's many other other quotes along the same lines. But I love Trotsky's quote because what, what it tells you is that uh, what it, what's implied in that is that, you know, is that war is not going away. Like you can't yeah. just say I'm not interested in it. And therefore, you know, if I don't talk about it, it won't happen. I mean, this is something I talk about in the introduction to my book. And I couldn't uh, agree more, you know, with that. And, and I think the, our, the first step to acknowledging that there is this potential danger, that there is this phenomenon that has wreaked such havoc and can cause such uh, harm on such a level is to understand uh, that it is uh, part of, of human nature. We have in, in chapter one, I go into the anthropology, I go into the archaeology, et cetera, and talk about how, uh, you know, we have an innate capacity, both in terms, you know, naturally it makes perfect sense. If you look at evolution and, and the latest science for us to have very altruistic sides, non-violent side, you know, that aids us in getting along inside our country, inside our personal group. But then on the other hand, we have this massive capacity, you know, for belligerence and, and for violence, which, you know, in evolutionary terms, you know, protected our groups from uh, being exploited by more, more, more violent groups. And so these things are natural parts of us. And I just don't think they can be engineered out. So I would definitely agree. I have a quote from Victor Davis Hanson, who I, who I admire tremendously, a uh, historian, who also says that the, the danger is not in is is not in um, uh, you know ignore ignore the danger is not in like acknowledging war it's in it's in ignoring war yeah, yeah. that that's where we're going to fall into it into into deluding ourselves that that it's gone well so some of the theorists that you cited a lot were Sun Tzu Thucydides. Carl von Clausewitz, it definitely seemed through reading through it, I, I saw Clausewitz over and over and over again. And I thought this person occupies a special place in this book. Um, 
So, uh, you know, those those three seem like they were big. I think you'd mentioned a, an essential seven a few moments ago. Right. I, I also wanted to ask about some that I didn't see that much. Uh, so Julius Caesar, Hannibal, uh, Napoleon, Duke Wellington. These Now, those are some of the most famous generals in history. I really didn't see a lot about them. I was wondering, is that because they're more practitioners rather than theorists? I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it. Um, you know, uh, just because you're not, a th I mean, in the preface, I talk about how rare theorists actually are. Um, it's really hard to find anyone who, there's plenty of pundits, uh, there's plenty of commentators, uh, there's historians, you know, who, who uh, pull out some essential truths. But as far as like trying to create a comprehensive theory, there are very few. Um, and I try to highlight most of those that I think qualify. Um, but uh, I would say that those, um, you know, Caesar, uh, these, these individuals said and did amazing things. And they were very successful. Napoleon, Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great, uh, you know, uh, Mar Marlboro. I mean, you can go on. There's many, many. Um, and, and so they're very, very important in terms of generating the data um, that, that a theorist or a historian would use to create theory. Um, but not all of them, you know, have the, have the temperament or desire to be theorists. They know what it takes to be successful. They have what cause what's called the, the coup de wheel the inner eye of uh, being able to see beyond the next hill, be able to process more information and make uh, decisions off of it faster than other people more easily. And this is an aptitude thing. It's very critical to Clausewitz's um, theory, uh, which is something I think I highlight maybe better than, than other commentators on Clausewitz, which is really his theory requires the military genius, uh, who in his time, of course, was Napoleon. Because, because of the way he framed war and its complexity, you had to almost have the military genius as a concept to explain how people like Napoleon could be so successful in the, in the face of the fog and the friction, the uncertainty, the turmoil of war. And so Clausewitz had a great deal of, uh, of respect uh, for even Napoleon, who he, who he had reason to hate, obviously, because he you know, made a mincemeat out of Prussia. Um, but at the same time, he admired him and used him as the basis of the theory. So uh, absolutely... Um, you know, uh, I would say that those individuals are, are and we see it all over the place and we see it in other other disciplines as well and professions where we have the people that are fantastic uh, practitioners, whether they're engineers or doctors or whatever, and then other individuals that are writing the textbooks and so forth on, and really, really finding out wh what that magnific magnificent, magnificence, excuse me, is for, for other uh, folks. And I think that's what Clausewitz and the other theorists were trying to do. They're trying to say, look, this is what you really need to know. And you don't have to be a military genius if you know these basics. You know, we can short circuit that. And Clausewitz's point was Clausewitz wanted Prussia to, to win the day against France. That's ultimately what he's trying to do. He's trying to arm his own people with, with, the tool, with the intellectual tools to be successful. And of course, he passed, unfortunately, before he could finish it. And that's one of the reasons why he's so uh, controversial. But definitely uh, the ironic thing is uh, Cambridge, one of the Cambridge reviewers that was looking at the book as I was trying to get it published, um, you know, said said that, you know, I wasn't nice enough to Clausewitz and so he didn't he didn't like my book. And I was like, I don't think he and he didn't read the whole thing, you know, in fairness to him. He was just reading a small portion. Um, but I think I do as well a job as, as anyone has in being fair to Clausewitz, but also being honest about where he he fell short and why why we need you know, the new art of war, for example, to take us another step farther. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's not just that, but it's also things like technological change, right? And I think one of the things that you have tried to separate is the nature of war itself, right, on a theoretical basis, from the means of warfare, you know, how it's conducted. But, you know, I, I still, I have to ask, how does the interconnected nature of today's world change warfare, um, technology comes to mind, right? You discussed cyber warfare in the book, which is relatively new. And right now we're on the advent of seeing large scale drone warfare in Ukraine. So I, as this continues to move forward, you, you know, it, does, does that complicate things, I guess, this rapid pace? Does it just increase the tempo of war or, or are there more fundamental changes? Yeah. That's a great question. And um, I think one of the things I talk about in my book is the danger of presentism. You know, the things that we see right in front of our face suddenly gain massive meaning and other things just fade into the background. So that was one of the challenges of the book is if you're going to be a theorist and you're going to write abstract, you've got to like ignore that blinding light of 
what you're seeing right in front of you and try to take it all in and 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 say all right these you know this is really what's happening here this is the arc of things uh you know over a vast period of time with many different examples to substantiate um so first of all i would just say that like we we have to if we really want to think about a war objectively and most of us can't and another this is another reason why i've written the books i want to help people do that i want to help people understand all right here's what's happening in technology uh, it's, it is important. It is going to be impactful. But as you said, it, it affects the character of war, which is all those things with, about war that change. Uh, technology changes. The reason, you know, the, the, in, the specific reasons why people are fighting, those are going to change. The specific political circumstances, the specific things related to geography. But we can make general, generalizations about a lot of these things and, and boil it down to, again, the big picture, which is like there's always violence. There's always a political reason. Uh, it, it, you know, there's always, uh, you know, these different factors, as Clausewitz pointed out in his Trinity, um, there's, there's, that are going to be interwoven into it. And, and that will be the case no matter what, no matter what scale, whatever time. But technology is very important. It's, it's some, some cases it's much easier to forecast and pay attention to than, for example, political changes, which can happen yeah. on a dime. I mean, no, nobody in 1987 thought the Soviet Union would be gone by 1991. I mean, nobody said that at all. So like within just a few years, we had a complete change. So um, but technology, um, it makes it complex. It speeds things up. But when you think about an accelerant like that, you have to say that's not always necessarily good. We can go if we're if we're going in the wrong direction really fast, it's not helpful that we're moving faster. Right. Um, and so technology can can do that, especially with the massive amount of information and the fact that it can all easily be corrupted. We have, uh, you know, massive enterprises at work uh, throughout the world to corrupt everybody's information from, you know, whether it's governments or it's or it's the commercial world. And so we have to sift through what's true and what's not. And when you don't know what's true, and in particular, we all know the first thing that dies in war is the truth. Yeah, uh, it's really hard to make uh, uh, an accurate decision about what's happening. And so and so, yes, it speeds it up. Uh, things like uh, things like drones and hypersonic weapons and. Um, all these things that seem so exciting and new new to us now, part of my objective with the book is to ground people back to reality and say, here's how these things are really impacting. Here's the truth, because there's a lot of hyperbole out there about these things. Um, and here's really where we are and what the important things are. And it, both, and it really comes down more, um, as I say, when you're trying to assess future war, um, there's, there is technology as a piece of that. But there's also doctrine, which is how people are training to fight and how they anticipate using the technology. And a lot of times they don't have it right. We didn't we have we didn't have it right in World War II for a while. Uh, pretty much every war we've been in, we haven't had it right for a while. Um, but then on top of that, there's the political dimension of it. And we can't lose sight of that. And that's driving a lot of this stuff, whether things will be used or whether they won't be used, uh, et cetera. And those changes can be can be massive. Um, if we're not paying attention to them. So technology is a piece of the puzzle, but it's definitely not the whole thing. And if we pin our hopes on that alone, uh, which is a character of war var variable, and we lose sight of the nature of war and how this all fits together and what's really important. You know, we're working, you know, people make say, the space domains indispensable, the cyber domains indispensable. All right, these are great, but the cognitive domain is really where war is, is going to be fought, no matter the technology. So if our technology doesn't influence this, it's not going to have the effect that we want. Mm, OK, well, and you mentioned the political realm of things several times. And, you know, the media is changing that so rapidly as well. I, I'm thinking back to the Iraq invasion, I, you know. One of the things that I recall was seeing uh, just from embedded troops, I think this was on CNN, seeing those lead Humvees go into Iraq, you know, as part of that convoy driving down towards Baghdad during the invasion. And that was live on television, you know, right. and and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people were watching that live as those vehicles went through and they didn't know what was going to happen. You know, and that was 20 years ago. Today, we can see live feeds from multiple areas and you know you could see these things in real time right so um you know it, it seems like politically people could be influenced in unpredictable ways in real time it seems like that's an aspect yeah, i mean that's a great point um because that's one thing that i that i don't think i effectively highlighted as well as i should have but the fact that you bring it up is perfect 
And that is that uh, the, the, that instantaneous information, like I said, what's important, it's what's in here and it's the political level, right? As to whether we fight or don't. And, and there's differences between forms of government too, right? So in the US, for example, a, a major center of gravity is the electorate, right? Yeah. In Russia, it's not as important a center of gravity. You know, Putin is pretty much the only important center of gravity there. The people, it doesn't matter what they want because it's authoritarian. So that information, uh, you, for example, it can drive much quicker political change uh, that will change a, a country's political will to fight in a, in, a, in a democratic nation like the U.S. This is something that B.H. Little Hart brought up uh, really effectively in his work, which I highlight in, in my book. But um, the nature of like how these decisions are made and how influential it is to the, to the electorate and how that can so rapidly drive change. Whereas in an authoritarian regime, you know, these these images may not drive change as fast, but they still can. And we're seeing that, for example, right now, you can read about it in Iran. You can read about it in China. There are individuals who are who are seeing and those countries are trying to stifle information from the outside on, you know, just exactly what's going wrong with their policies and how things are different in the world. So immensely important to politics and therefore immensely important to war fighting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess that the final change that I really wanted to ask about, and again, this comes out of uh, modern times. I know that the world has always had trade and financial interconnectivity, but I think that the scale and level and level of depth in today's world it has, it's fundamentally changing things. Um, for instance, the U.S. and China have currently have strategic tensions, but we're also major trade partners. We have mutual financial debt and commitments, and our technology supply chain, in our case, is closely tied to their economy. So how does this complicate war from a theory perspective to have so many countries so deeply intertwined on a financial level today? So, so uh, I don't think it changes theory per se. Um, again, you know, theory takes into account the influence of economics, but the specificity of it, um, you know, definitely plays a major factor, uh, and, it, and it plays a huge role in, in the strategic calculus, which is to say, you know, what are the what are the pros and cons? What is the cost and risk of war versus some other form of competition? Uh, you know, in terms of our our, our grand strategy and uh, what a lot of people don't remember is that before World War II, the, the Europeans were very interconnected, uh, both uh, financially and in terms of like, you know, blood relationships and all these other different things. I mean, yeah, yeah. The Kaiser and all that, you know, all these other people had, you know, close relationships. But one, one of the things I think you have to realize is that, yes, amazing, immensely important when when you look at strategic calculus but we but we can very frequently this is where it's in in my book it would be in the second essential act of strategy which is where we look at caught basically the cost benefit of ways and means of employing war to, to support our political objectives and and we're very bad at, at doing that effectively because we always have a rosy view of what the outcome is going to be and we always think we're going to do it fast and if i had to emphasize one thing with relation to the financial piece there's there's frequently a belief that it's going to happen fast that happened in World War I. The Kaiser thought he was going to win this thing in three weeks, uh, and then it was going to be over. And so the financial impact would have been minimal. I mean, minimal investment up front. Then you have then you're basically dictating the financial policy of the con country that you conquered. And, you know, you build things back up and, and in no time. You're, you're fine. Look at Russia. Horrible miscalculation. They thought Ukraine would be quick. Look at the economic impact on Russia. There's no way that Putin uh, assessed these things accurately. And now China is having to look at the same thing because they're like, if we're going to we are intertwined with the United States of America. And if we attack, we better win quick, because otherwise the whole financial system, the financial system is going to take a hit. But we have to believe, number one, we're going to preserve. We have the best chance of preserving the Chinese Communist Party uh, by doing this. And number two, when we come out of it, we're going to be even better positioned financially and influence wise than we were before. And so when you want to think about, for example, is China going to do it? You need to think about those two things. And if yeah. China gets to the point where they believe that they can sustain the regime better and that they'll be in a better place afterwards, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. In other words, not having a democratic Taiwan right on their on their doorstep, a democratic capitalist Taiwan that's a negative influence on their power. Maybe that's what their calculation is. Um, you know, then they might be willing to do it. So definitely from a deterrent standpoint, it factors into war and peace because those individuals that want to resist that need to make that cost in the second uh, 
essential active strategy look prohibitive uh, to, the, to the Chinese, for example, to, to extend that example. So uh, I think it matters, um, but, but the way it matters is that if you want to stop that, then you prevent them from thinking they can do it quickly. Okay. Okay. Because over time, they have to understand it's going to wreck their economy. Now, now Putin's in for a penny, in for a pound. I mean, he has no, he's 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 totally behind the eight ball there, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out um, going forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, and that is a challenge, you know. And deterrence, I think that's the key word. Clausewitz wrote, and you cited this: two different motives make men fight one another: hostile feelings and hostile intentions. And again, in the book with this synthesis, you cited science describing our tribal nature, um, our tendency to separate people into us and them, and things like this are what give rise to conflict. I'm wondering, can some of these theoretical approaches to war that you've studied help us to short circuit these impulses that lead to conflict? Well, I think I think they can, because when we recognize that uh, that that uh, war should never be something that's impulsive, we recognize that it that, that it's, it needs to be an aspect of strategy. As Clausewitz said, that there, there's a rational and political aspect to it. It's not just chance and it's not just emotion and violence. Uh, I think if we if we understand it, you know, in my book, I say that's the key to, number one, preventing war. Uh, and then number two, if, you know, trying to minimize the occurrence of war, if we can, um, or, or at least when wars are underway to, to minimize the lethality and destruction of them. And then number three is that in some cases we have to fight a war. Um, for example, if we're, we're attacked, um, you know, if, if we want to like fight for our lives, you know, we, so in those circumstances, we want to win and win as quickly and effectively as we can. And so I think an understanding of theory uh, is going to help that just as it would with any, any hazard that, that we have or that we face, uh, you know, if we don't understand the dynamics of weather, for example, we're at the mercy of hurricanes, tornadoes, yeah. et cetera. Um, if we don't understand disease, we're at the mercy of pathogens, et cetera. The more we understand about these things, the more we lessen their their impact, uh, their negative impacts. And I think it's exactly the same with war. But at the same time, I think we'd be foolish. And I and I spend quite a bit of time uh, at the end of the book, you know, examining our ability to to eliminate war, if you will, completely. And I think we just run into all kinds of dangers, uh, and we and, and we become delusional when we think that there are either institutions or individual things that we can do either, you know, whether through genetic engineering or some other kind of program to like make humans less warlike, if you will. These are not, uh, these are recipes for disaster and not um, remedies ultimately. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jeffrey, let me thank you again so much for your time today and your career of service. I, I want to end actually with a quote, another quote from the book. Back in 1888, Otto von Bismarck famously predicted that one day the Great European War will come out of some damned foolish thing in the Balkans. And I, I guess I would view war as kind of an unwelcome visitor, but it's one that we can see coming a ways down the road. Um, if it's OK, let me close by asking, when you look down the road, what are your largest concerns at the moment? Well, I, I think it's a great thing to end this uh, on uh, is that quote, Bismarck being one of the individuals that had one of the best understandings of both war and diplomacy. Uh, in his time, uh, very, very much a realist, but at the same time, uh, very, very much, uh, you know, appreciating of, of the impact of human nature and, and ultimately international relations. And it's absolutely, I really want to thank you for this opportunity. It's really been a privilege to um, to serve this nation and to have an opportunity to uh, to uh, defend our, our, our democracy here. Uh, so the biggest concerns for me, really, I think, one is we haven't really talked on this very much, and, and, and I think that's actually indicative of the state of things right now, although you're hearing more about it right now. And I do talk about it quite a bit in my book because I think it's important, and that is nuclear nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, we, uh, so my bigger my biggest concerns are that because I believe that right now, uh, as I say in the book, I think nuclear weapons have really prevented us from going to uh, great power war. Uh, massive world wars at a conventional level because uh, they they short circuit the strategic calculus in the in the in the pro con area. There's just no benefit if there's any chance at all that a country is going to have a nuclear exchange. There's just no benefit to it, and so it's, no one wants to touch that. But my concern is that as we get farther and farther away from World War II in 1945, we will lose sight of that. That could be one thing, and we may think that you know they're once again something that we can somehow use. 
Uh, and then the other piece is that, uh, that, that what we may find out is that um, because nobody has used them, it's almost a catch-22 because on one hand, we may think we can use them more because they haven't been used in so long and we're, we're smarter than everybody else, which is, a, which is a common pitfall of history. And the other side of that is that if they're not used, then countries may believe they can do anything and no country will ever have the will to use them. And so in that, in that, in that event, uh, you know, you, people are, you know, someone like Russia, for example, say, well, I'm just going to roll into Ukraine and I'll take some, some other country, you know, NATO would never have the will. Because deterrence lose its value as soon as you uh, don't believe that your adversary will actually do any do do with it what it is that you fear that thing that will impose cost or prevent you from being successful. So I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid of a, 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 a dissolution of deterrence over time that could lead to to great power war again. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is I'm just I'm concerned about um, division in the United States of America and in this country because I think a lot of people just don't appreciate. Uh, how important uh, a united, um, you know, healthy United States is on the world stage. And if if the U.S. Uh, were to to shrink into itself in, in internal violence, we would just be recreating history that history has seen so many times. We've seen it with Rome. We've seen it with almost every great power eventually it turn, that, that isn't conquered immediately from without. Uh, it crum crumbles from within. And uh, in that case, uh, we could just see so many things erupt around the world. And we're already seeing whispers of it here and there. And so those are the things that really concern me and kind of keep me up at night is that, uh, you know, number one, we'll, we'll lose this deterrence effect and we'll go back to a pattern that was extraordinarily destructive. Uh, and then two is that, uh, is that the U.S., which has been such a stabilizing force for so long, uh, will, will shrink from that role uh, for one reason or another. And, uh, and then we'll see uh, a lot of uh, un unfortunate things start to erupt. Jeffrey, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Well, you're very welcome, Tim. So happy to be here. And, uh, and, and I hope you have a great, uh, great holiday season.